Good morning, or afternoon, I guess, just, just that, noon. Um, my name is Tim Nature. I'm with Metro Parks. Thank you all for um, being here today. Um, Gary Gaston is here, but he's under the weather, so he has uh, asked me to um, uh, share his appreciation with all of you for being here. Um, I'll, I'll second that for Metro Parks. Um, and thanks from both of us to the Frist for sharing this um, incredible venue with us. Um, how many of you were able to uh, participate or attend at either of the two previous uh, talks in this Future of Parks uh, series? Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for investing your time. Um, it's an important subject for this city, particular at this point in our, particularly at this point in our history. Um, um, this has been a fantastic partnership um, with uh, the Civic Design Center. We're lucky to have them in this city. Um, I want to thank Gary and also um, Jolie and Joe and the others at the Civic Design Center who have uh, helped make this happen. I also want to recognize Rebecca Rotz at Metro Parks, who has been so instrumental in pulling this together, uh, and our co-sponsors, the Trust for Public Land, the Nashville Parks Foundation, uh, the Tennessee ASLA, and the Cumberland River Compact. As you know by now, we have been working on Plan to Play, the Nashville Parks and Greenways Master Plan now for almost a year. And uh, in another month or two, we'll be able to share that final product with all of you. This will be our guidebook for uh, sustainable and equitable growth of our park system for the next 10 to 12 years. And that plan will not only establish goals for new land and facilities and programs, sort of the what part of the plan, um, just as importantly, or, or perhaps even uh, more importantly, uh, it will recommend new strategies and tools for the financing and operating of our park system. Um, what has become clear through this process is that when it comes to parks, Nashville needs a bigger toolbox. Um, our speaker today has written the book several of them, actually, um, on the best and most innovative strategies being employed by city park systems throughout the country. Um, Peter Harnick has had his finger on the pulse of America's parks for decades, um, and we're uh, grateful to have him here in Nashville. Um, to introduce Peter, I would, uh, I'll ask Rick Wood uh, to come to the stage. Rick is the executive director of the Tennessee uh, Trust for Public Land out of Chattanooga. TPL has been a great partner with us on the acquisition, recent acquisition of some new parks properties and a number of other initiatives. Um, and Rick, thank you. Hey there, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rick Wood. I'm the Tennessee State Director of the Trust for Public Land and really excited to be here and, and thank you for the opportunity. And we're really excited to be a partner in this Parks Master Plan, Plan to Play, and look forward to working with you guys and with this city um, on helping bring this plan to life and, and implementing this plan and working with so many of you and looking forward to getting to know you even better. Um, and and uh, I'm looking at Hawkins Partners. Thank you guys for being the lead on this project and working so diligently day and night on, on bringing this master plan uh, to fruition. Uh, it's exciting to bring um, Peter Harnick here. And before I get to Peter, I want to want to recognize Andre Lequires in this audience somewhere. And Andre, right down front here. Andre is our uh, our right now our our first. Uh, Nashville board member Tennessee, for our Tennessee Advisory Board and um, thank you Andre for your leadership and guidance um, so far and we look forward to adding new members to that board. Um, Peter is a colleague of mine and, and we've had the chance to work together for a while and um, I've been with the Trust for Public Land for 16 years and Peter has, has directed the Center for City Park Excellence for 16 years. And with that, he's written the book um, *Urban Green*, where um, that's the yeah *Urban Green*, where he really dialed in on finding parkland and how do you deal with parkland in rapidly growing areas, which is a you know very very um, um, uh, it's just very applicable to today and to this city. So um, looking forward to hearing you, Peter, on that. Uh, before. Peter came to the Trust for Public Land. He helped co-found Rails to Trails Conservancy. So many of you know about Rails to Trails. And so Peter is one of those co-founders. You can thank Peter 
uh, for a lot of those transformations that have happened across the country where we get our great trails. He lives in Washington, D.C., and we have the honor today because Peter has just entered retirement. And we are the first, you're the first audience to hear him on his retirement tour. <laughs> so thank you, Peter. I look forward to your comments. Thank you, Rick and Tim. Thank you all for coming on this cloudy, uh, gray day. Wonderful turnout, I think indicative of the tremendous enthusiasm here in Nashville for parks and civic betterment and uh, transformational change, which, is, which we're all so excited about. I haven't been to Nashville, it's probably been about uh, seven or eight years since I've been here last which is too long for a city like Nashville. You really can't come every seven or eight years because it, uh, it changes so fast. So I promise to come back uh, more quickly the next time around. Um, Tim, uh, Tim gave me one little warning. <laughs> for those of you who saw some of the early speakers, he said, oh, by the way, uh, when Thomas Waltz spoke last time, uh, everybody cried. So that, that, <laughs> that sets a pretty high bar. I don't know if I can make you all cry, but maybe I can make you smile. So uh, very pleased to be here. Uh, the fabulous stories about city parks are coming at us fast and furious. The High Line in New York, Millennium Park in Chicago, Grand Park in I was told this will take a second. Kevin? <laughs> okay, there we go, there we go. Grand Park in uh, Los Angeles, uh, Olympic Sculpture Park in Seattle. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, City Garden, some of you may have seen in St. Louis, one of my favorite uh, new smaller parks in St. Louis. Overton Park in Memphis with its new bike gate sculpture. Payne's Park in Philadelphia, which marries skateboarding with uh, water, complete stormwater management. The development of the Shelby County Penal Farm in Memphis into 3,200 acre Shelby Farms Park with, among other things, this amazing 12 acre playground. Commons Park in Denver, which has been absolutely transformational in the uh, revitalization of downtown Denver. Historic Fourth Ward Park in Atlanta. And the Beltline in Atlanta the uh, new uh, circular trail system around the center of Atlanta that is transforming that city. In my own town of Washington, which had historic parks for many years, we have new parks along the Potomac River and along the Anacostia River. If you're, if you're about 15 or 20 years old, this may not sound terribly out of the ordinary. Of course cities keep adding fantastic new parks. Duh, just like Apple keeps inventing shiny new toys and Ben and Jerry's keeps coming up with crazy new flavors for its ice cream. But if you're any older than that, you know what an amazing change of climate, the political and economic climate this news represents. I asked my 24-year-old intern a couple of months ago to do a dive into the newspapers from around 1990, and he came back rather wide-eyed to me. He told me he found stories. The population of St. Louis, which had stood at 857,000 in 1950, fell to 397,000 by 1990. In just 10 years after 1980, the population of Cleveland fell 24%. In 1990, which was at the height of the crack act epidemic, 2,245 people were murdered in New York City which compares with 328 murders last year in New York. The number of violent crimes in the United States in 1991 was 758 per, per 100,000 people, which was the all-time peak, mostly in cities. 
Uh, as a result of deferred maintenance in the 1990s, trips on the New York City subway system could take up to four times as long as they took back in 1915, and graffiti was rampant. Uh, in 1993, some of you remember, the Milwaukee water system became contaminated with cryptosporidium, and it took the city more than a week to discover the problem, and 400,000 people got sick. When he, when he came back and gave me the stack of headlines, he said, no wonder my parents moved out of town right around then. And his city, by the way, was Grand Rapids, Michigan. So it was happening everywhere, big cities, medium-sized cities. But in contrast, something good is happening in cities these days. The full panoply of factors is, is too complicated for a talk uh, this noontime. <laughs> but it includes demographic and economic shifts, technological shifts, and even just preferences. We older folks are sometimes astonished to hear young people saying that they're not all that interested in driving. Many of them aren't even running out to get their driver's license the, day, the, the, the moment they turn 18 or 17 or 16. It's not that we've reached urban nirvana, not by a long shot, but the tide appears to be turning and Nashville could well be a leading emblem of this new way of thinking, from poster region of sprawl to poster city of renewed urbanism. And parks are partly a symptom and partly a, a cause of this urban rebirth. In many cases, rejuvenating a neighborhood leads to a rising tide that lifts parks along with housing, retail, street quality, and beauty. In other cases, maybe less uh, frequently, but still just as important, rejuvenating a park can re re lead to a renewed interest and investment in the surrounding neighborhood. This is particularly gratifying to us parkies, and I've been following a situation like this in Baltimore for a decade now. Perhaps there's one in Nashville too. If you're tired of that kind of banal phrase about chickens and eggs, maybe you can say, which comes back first, the park or the neighborhood? <clears throat> this may be our secret uh, mantra for parkies. And of course, there's a mirror image of this too that we all need to be aware of and thinking about. The kind of trend that was happening at, in the worst, uh, worst times of the 1980s. Which declines first, the park or the neighborhood? That's why it's also so important to keep up the maintenance and programming of parks that we have. I'm a fan of parks for many, many reasons, but probably the prime one for me is their role in smart growth, their role in fostering compact, walkable, three-dimensional neighborhoods that also preserve the rural outlying forested areas that make city living tolerable and, and wonderful to be able to get out into the country uh, easily. And I hope that the phrase park-oriented development will be as prevalent one day as transit-oriented development is becoming today and as highway-oriented development was back in the 60s and 70s and 80s. People like to live near parks. They're even willing to pay more for a house near a park or an apartment with a park view and easy access. And parks are good for them, thanks, for, thanks to cleaner air and the place to exercise and unwind spiritually and mentally. My organization, the Trust for Public Land, Rick's and my organization, began with the mission back in 1972 of buying and protecting land for parks. We've been quite successful protecting more than three million acres around the country. And even in cities with much smaller parcels that we uh, spend our money on and get donations for, we've bought about 35,000 acres of parks in cities. We've now set our sights on a slightly new uh, mission, which is to help to assure that every urbanized American, every American who lives in an urbanized area, is, in, is within a half mile walk, 10 minute, a half mile, 10 minute walk of a park. So uh, back when I was at TPL, two months ago, before I retired, just recently, uh, I was the numbers person there. Uh, so um, 
after the TPL leadership came up with this goal of uh, every American within 10 minutes to a park, they asked me to figure out what it would take to get there. Yes, this is perhaps a little backwards, but some of the world's greatest ideas have, been, have come up on uh, napkins and then asked people to figure out if they were a good idea and how to make them happen. So we got to work hoping for the best. So our rudimentary calculations showed that between um, <clears throat> 90 and 110, 111 million urban and suburban Americans are more than half a mile from a park. So the total population of the United States is about 318 million, 60 million of whom are living out in, in the wilderness, in the countryside where they, they, they live among greenery. They don't really need a separate parks to uh, meet their needs for greenery. Um, about 100, somewhere between 147 uh, no, in the last column, yeah, 147 to 168 million people already live within a 10-minute walk to a park, leaving about 90 to 111 million people that don't live that close to a park and need that kind of access and need that kind of help from the Trust for Public Land, Land Trust of Tennessee, and, and all the other organizations that are working together to provide parkland for Americans. And these were very rudimentary calculations. We've got a team of people in our Santa Fe office that are doing detailed GIS evaluation from not only city to city, but suburb to suburb and, and town center to town center to, to uh, nail down these numbers. And we'll, get, we'll be having more accurate numbers uh, soon. Doing this, creating uh, uh, walkable parks for everybody by adding new parks is uh, by sort of dropping them into a neighborhood like that uh, is a very, very big job. With the average park serving something like 1,800 to 2,000 people in a half mile radius, we would need to create nearly 60,000 new parks in America's cities, suburbs, and towns. This would be a very major undertaking in the first 400 years of our uh, nation, we've only created 20,000 parks in the big cities. So getting all the way up to 60,000 would take us to the year 3174. <laughs> Actually, you could cry. Maybe, maybe you should cry at this point. <laughs> this is our chance to cry. So that's a long, but there's another way of doing it. In addition, we're all in favor of creating new parks and we have to create lots of new parks. But there's another way of doing it uh, too, which is to increase the density around the existing parks, not necessarily to this kind of super high density that you see in Philadelphia around Rittenhouse Square, um, but, uh, or this kind of density around Central Park in New York, but increasing the density. And what this is what my researcher, who heard about this the first time, and he turned to me and he said, oh, you mean not only parks for people, but more people for the parks. And that was really true because um, there's a lot of parks that are really underutilized um, and uh, bringing more people to the parks, uh, getting better use out of our existing parks, out of our existing investment in parks, uh, would be a terrifically cost-effective way of getting to the goal of having people be near parks. The parallel concept is with transit. It's by now well established that the expense of building and operating transit can and should be earned back through the promotion of transit-oriented development. Dense pockets of housing, commercial and retail within about a 2,000 foot radius of a subway station or a major trolley stop or a major bus stop. And 2,000 feet is, is pretty much uh, close to uh, half a mile. So, uh, the way the developers think, that 2,000-foot golden circle, and the way we think, the half-mile walk to a park, is, is pretty much in alignment. The same logic can hold for park-oriented development. Even though transit is the strongest generator of demand for urban consolidation and density, parks can also be highly significant. People like to have greenery close enough to walk to and to have their children play in, and it's doubly true if, they have, if there's no car parking in the in the park, and, uh, or, or very little, and uh, it's easier to walk to a park. It becomes even more valuable. So the, par the density of housing around parks uh, that we've studied around the country varies tremendously. This is Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. 
much more low-rise development, but very tightly packed in there. It's pretty high density around an absolutely wonderful park, highly desirable park in San Francisco. This is a, a park that I really love in Phoenix called Encanto Park. Uh, lower density, uh, still lower density, but uh, all these people have a, a wonderful access to the park. And then this is a suburban park outside of Detroit even lower density, but um, the, the range is, is tremendous, and we've been studying, we've been trying to come up with a numerical study on this. So, for instance, Forest Park in, in Portland, Oregon, is one of the largest city parks, it's about 5,000 acres, one of the largest city parks in the country, but because of its location, because of the way it's designed and its history, it's actually, it actually has a very low population density around it. Only 4,000 people uh, live within half a mile walking distance of this huge park, uh, which is wonderful for them, but it's a really underutilized park. In contrast, Riverside Park in Manhattan, uh, which is a much smaller park, it's only 222 acres, but it serves uh, over 250,000 people within a half mile walk. There's no parking at all in Riverside Park, but that many people can walk to it and do walk to it, so it's very heavily used. It's, it's always full to the brim. You've probably seen it in movies. Uh, it was, it was the, uh, one of the scenes in You've Got Mail at the end of the movie there and many other great scenes, views of the river and um, a wonderful uh, uh, recreational and social space for uh, uh, New York. Here's another consideration. If population density around a park is very low, that means by definition that fewer people live close enough to walk to it, and it means that many of them are gonna to have to drive, and that parks departments end up uh, providing more and more of their park space for parking. Uh, and so more and more of these, parking, of these parks are given over to parking lots. Um, <clears throat> I'm, gonna talk, I'm gonna talk a little while on a, on a blank screen, but, uh, clearly, not all surrounding neighborhoods are already filled up. In fact, we're getting more and more evidence that a very large number of city parks are woefully underused and would actually benefit by having more people living around them within a half mile. Of course, this approach is not necessarily easy. Uh, there are political challenges to it. It would involve changing zoning, and de development incentives to raise density around existing parks. In some cases, there's not enough demand today to entice developers to build more densely. In other cases, there might be strong uh, resistance by current residents. In all cases, the political and developmental communities would have to understand that park-oriented development is economically beneficial to the city and environmentally beneficial to the surrounding region just the way transit-oriented development is, and just the way it took this nation a long time to start thinking about transit-oriented development. But um, in the Northeast, of course, it's pretty much of a given, and I know that it's spreading like wildfire here in the Nashville area. Interestingly, would this densification strategy cost more or less than simply buying more land? That's another issue that the Trust for Public Land is going to be studying. We don't really know the answer to that question yet, but there is one major difference that is worth thinking about. Buying more land for parks requires public money, while changing the urban form can be done largely through private money. You already have the parkland investment by the uh, public agency, by the city and the county, and small changes in zoning rules and or incentives for developers to allow private developers to enter the market and assume the risk and return for likely profit will shift some of the costs over to the private sector, which is so key in this time of very limited public resources. Let's dig in a little bit to the reality of parks and cities. In January 1954, in an orange grove outside of Los Angeles, ground was broken for Disneyland. Fifty years later, in July 2004, on top of a rail yard in the heart of Chicago, the ribbon was cut for Millennium Park. 
Halfway between those two events in December of 1980, New York City, in New York City, the Central Park Conservancy was incorporated. Three very different cities, three momentous occurrences in the park world. And, to go, and together they may serve as kind of the cultural bookends of the baby boom generation's uh, relationship to parks. From the moment that Disneyland opened, it became the new paradigm of a park experience. Corporate, programmed, extravagant, flawless, rural oriented and electrifying. And it wasn't a coincidence that when the moment Disneyland opened, the old urban park systems, which were unprogrammed, democratic, unpredictable and free, started grinding down. Relentlessly, anywhere, everywhere from Franklin Park in Boston to Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, they all started hitting hard times. There was something completely new in the air and it was exciting. The park experience could be sanitized. Social classes could be segregated. Suburban backyards would meet most of the old needs of, quote, city parks and Disneyland or the concept of Disneyland would pick up all the rest. But by 2004, those original Disneyland children had gray hair, aching backs, and worn out knees, and the thrill of spending $400 for a family trip to an amusement park had faded. <laughs> the suburban backyard was becoming a hassle, and the stairs up to the second floor were a bit tedious, and apartment, an apartment downtown seemed kind of intriguing, particularly if it would be near something like Millennium Park. No thrill rides, thank God, but concerts every week and a sumptuous garden that, uh, with eye-popping sculpture and wonderful fountains and concerts and, uh, and uh, ice skating in the winter, if, if you think we can still ice skate, and two restaurants and a serpentine bridge that wows visiting relatives who come to visit and a constant stream of in interesting humanity to watch all the time, and finally a sense of being back in the center of things. Meanwhile, back in New York, where the city park movement had initially started back in the 1860s, Central Park was the scene of a completely different experiment and a kind of an un-American experiment, the unprecedented attempt not to replace something old and, and worn out, but to gloriously refurbish it. Beginning with wealthy and influential neighbors looking out for their own safety and real estate values and views, the Conservancy evolved into a sophisticated and admired spouse of the City Parks Department, seemingly knowing every, dan every step of the complicated dance that is the daily relationship between a city and its greatest park. Millennium Park exploded onto the scene with an impact not felt since Central Park was originally created, and Central Park itself clawed its way back from urban embarrassment to civic Cinderella over a period of several decades. In both cases, the price tag approached half a billion dollars. In both cases, the metropolitan effect from property values to tourism to unforgettableness and city pride to just plain enjoyment was priceless. And today, it's close to unimaginable for a tourist visiting either city not to sample those parks. Even more significant, the buzz is affecting virtually every other place too. Frankly, there's hardly a city worth its salt not considering some kind of new or revamped green gathering spa space around which to design a swinging downtown. Disneyland might technically still be fun, but that paradigm doesn't rule anymore, as we've seen here with the revitalization of your waterfront. So in addition to adding more dwellings around existing parks, what land opportunities are available for cities uh, to create new parks. How does a city actually get more parkland? And as Rick said in his intro, this is, this is a topic that I've been very interested in for my whole career. When cities are young and small and expanding, parks are added on the leading edge of the growth margin. They consist of natural lands, farms, forests, woodlands, wetlands, deserts, and others, other relatively undisturbed uh, properties that are donated or purchased for park use, like your Warner Park and, and many others. Often the trees and plant materials can be retained and little or no demolition is required, and sometimes no construction is required either. 
And this process is known as conservation. But in older cities or older parts of cities that are all built out, there's nothing natural to conserve. New parks must be created through development rather than through conservation. A derelict parking lot that might make a great new park wouldn't be conserved. It would be torn up and regraded and planted and fitted out with a playground or a fountain or a sports field or whatever the community wants and developed into a park. The goal in built out cities is to use creativity and perseverance to find space to do something different with. So how can cities squeeze more land out for parks? This means either buying something affordable, which is how the Trust for Public Land came into existence, acquiring vacated parcels from other government agencies, like this beautiful building, which used to be a post office, for instance, sharing land with other users, providing rules or incentives that encourage developers to donate certain land, using previously unused surfaces like rooftops, or making better use of existing parkland. There's a lot of opportunities to use our parkland better. And uh, this is the book that I actually wrote on this topic, Urban Green, Innovative Parks for Resurgent Cities. One place that exemplifies this approach is Atlanta. Many of you probably get to Atlanta every now and then. Atlanta started out being way behind in the parks. Uh, when we started counting parkland, we revealed to the surprise of Atlantans that Atlanta was way behind in parkland. And they, they had never heard uh, of their city not being number one in everything that they set their mind to. So uh, that was kind of sobering. They were kind of angry. But they set their mind to doing something about it. And um, it turns out that there were a bunch of abandoned railroads or, or semi-abandoned railroad lines doing a loop around the center city that became the Atlanta Belt Line. Our, my organization, Trust for Public Land, helped with this. But so did many, many other entities buying up land, trading land and creating this combination trail, um, transit way, and redevelopment node for, for the Beltline. Um, I didn't have an exact a picture of the Beltline trails, but here's two other trails. My, of course, most of you know what trails look like. Both of, both of these trails were made out of railroads. The one on the right is in Seattle. That was a conversion of an abandoned rail line. The one on the left is in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, and they've kept the rail line, but it's a rail with trail. And so there may be some opportunities here in Nashville to either have, abandoned, uh, have a trail on an abandoned property or just to double up with it so you can be alongside it without the lights and the cross traffic that make it so difficult for walkers and bicyclists. Or rooftop parks. Nashville's density probably, and your land prices at this point, probably haven't reached the break point on rooftop parks, but they're heading that way, the way San Francisco and New York already have. This is in San Francisco, a rooftop park on top of a garage. As you can see, extremely heavily used, um, extremely popular in Chinatown. Same thing with highway deck parks. This is in Dallas. Uh, and the highway at the extreme bottom of this picture and at the extreme top, you can see the highway poking out. And they covered three blocks of it with Clyde Warren Park. It's been revolutionary within the city of Dallas, um, uh, helping, uh, tremendously helping to reorient uh, the way Dallas, this is what it used to look like there. There were, the, this, the highway was previously sunken, uh, which is great. It had the opportunity to be decked. But uh, you can still see that even as a sunken highway, it really pretty much uh, ended up uh, spawning just parking lots and noise and uh, fumes and uh, a not a very attractive area. And so uh, this new park has, uh, has led to tremendous amount of redevelopment in that area. Um, another kind of property that I particularly like are cemeteries. You know, cemeteries uh, actually were some of the first parks in this country, Mount Auburn Cemetery. Some of you may have seen that show on public television earlier this year, 10 Parks That Changed America. Well, Mount Auburn Cemetery in, in Cambridge was very influential to Frederick Law Olmsted and other people. And so the initial cemetery, beautiful cemeteries, stimulated uh, park use. And uh, certain types of cemeteries can be much more 
particularly historic cemeteries that don't have a lot of burials and don't have uh, a lot of day-to-day uh, -day grieving people who are concerned about uh, the, you know, having runners or our other users uh, in the cemetery can become wonderful spaces for social gathering places. And here's one in Hartford, Connecticut that even has a jazz concert every Friday night. So there's all kinds of opportunities for cemeteries, which are usually beautiful places. And then, as I said, um, redesigning the existing parks that we have. It's even possible to get much more useful space out of the existing parkland by reducing parking, or at least restructuring parking, and in some cases, maybe charging for it. Um, of course, that's a very hot button item. But uh, if you have a situation where you have unlimited free parking in parks, uh, you ha you, you're just asking for traffic and you're, you're asking to be overrun. If you think about sometimes you saying, well, I'll meet you at the park and then, and then dad says, well, I gotta do an errand so I'll take, I'll take my car and I'll meet you at the park. And then sister says, well, I'll come to the game to watch my brother play soccer, but my, you know, my friends are gonna drive over there. You end up with four cars for one kid playing soccer. Uh, and, and no carpooling and no giving any thought to uh, the other needs that the park has. So even just uh, charging for parking or in doing other things to encourage carpooling to parks can uh, have a big impact on reducing the amount of uh, parking in parks. Uh, and there's just lots of examples of parks being overrun. This is actually in Washington, D.C. This park land is completely overrun with parking. Most people don't even really recognize that it's a park. The worst one that I've found so far is in New York City. Everything in this picture is considered park. <laughs> so think about where you'd want to take your blanket and have a picnic <laughs> spread out here with your family in a nice, relaxed atmosphere. Some of you may have heard uh, about what's going on in Memphis. I, I know probably most of you don't get to Memphis that much, but it is in Tennessee. <laughs> so uh, Memphis, as some of you might know, Overton Park, very historic park, very famous park. In fact, uh, Memphis was the park that uh, the, the court case went all the way up to the Supreme Court to, to prevent the inter Interstate 40 from going through the middle of the park. Well, the zoo is using uh, Overton Park's lawn. This is not a parking lot. This is the lawn of Overton Park for overflow parking on heavy zoo days. And it's been going on for many years, but gradually the, the park advocates in Memphis are saying, wait a second, this is not right. Uh, you're not supposed to be parking on our lawn. And uh, it has become a real flashpoint, very controversial issue now, and uh, I, I, all indications are that the new mayor is going to uh, have the zoo create structured parking to keep the cars either within the zoo or uh, using external parking lots and devising a sh shuttle system to bring people to the zoo. My favorite uh, success story is in Pittsburgh. So in the upper left, so, so, so this, this little square is, was the uh, entranceway to Shenley Park. Pittsburgh's most famous, largest, most famous park. I guess their equivalent of Centennial Park. And uh, through one thing or another, back in the 40, late 40s, somebody had the idea, well, let's, let's just park there. And, and so for, for about 50 years, it, it became a de facto parking lot, even though it was never really designed to do that. The Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy uh, started leaning on the city and on the universities around the edges of this park to do something, they did a bunch of studies, they found out there's really enough parking uh, in the area to absorb what people were just assuming was needed, and they took out that parking lot, converted it into a public space again, there's a restaurant, there's concerts, uh, there's just hanging out, it's, it's, become, it's Shenley Plaza, it's become the most successful uh, space in Pittsburgh leading into Shenley Park and uh, everybody loves it. They can't believe that they used to park in there. So let's talk about health and fitness too, a very big topic and, uh, and I want to get down to some realities about parks and health because there's a lot of uh, sort of platitudes about it. Um, 
At the Center for City Park Excellence, we, we really try and get down to brass tacks. You can't, you can't just go to a sedentary person and say, here, we're giving you a new park, go be healthy. Uh, you have to really, really meet them where they are on, on their terms. You have to understand why some people, many people, aren't using parks. Uh, the existing parks that they have, much less whether they would even want to be able to use a new park. A few years ago, we organized a colloquium to study this very question. We brought together 22 leaders in the fields of public health, mental health, parks and recreation, landscape architecture, non-motorized non -motorized transportation, and urban planning, and we sort of locked ourselves in a room for two days and really got down to the, to the details of how are parks being used, how are they provided, what do people think about them, what about the variables uh, on the Extern externalities around the sides of parks. And based on this work, we agreed that the one overriding principle is to, for parks to, be, to help be, people be healthy, they have to be well used. So half of you might be saying, well, duh, you spent two days coming up with that. And actually, that is not, uh, that's not a given. It's really not a given. Um, not all parks are well used. Not all park advocates want their parks to be well used. Not all park managers want their parks to be well used. And perhaps surprisingly, many people are scared of their parks. A surprisingly large number of people are scared of their parks. So physical activity is key to health and city parks are a resource for active urbanites, but many parks just don't make it easy to exercise. Some are too small, some are too big and confusing with poor signage, some are too far away, some are too frightening, some are too unattractive and unimaginative, some are mainly athletic complexes for very specialized, excuse me, very specialized users. Others are primarily natural in areas with just an occasional looping trail that's boring for many young people or com competitive people. In the starkest terms, most parks simply don't offer enough choices and opportunities for activity. Rather than being like an old-fashioned hardware store, the kind of place you just love to go in and see how much stuff can be crammed in, they're more like uh, convenience stores with small, predictable number of lowest common denominator wares. The more facilities and dis discrete spaces that can be layered into a park, the more use it can get from people with different interests and different skill levels. Like a golf course. A golf course can serve a couple hundred people a day. If you add a running trail, a walking trail, around the perimeter of the golf course, that same space can serve thousands of people. A playground is a nice place for small children to run around and exercise and practice their motor, school, motor skills but adding an adjacent fitness zone for adult exercisers uh, allows moms, dads, and nannies to get into shape while they're watching the kids. And the, kid, the, the kids, as they get older, to maybe start practicing on some of the machinery. A softball diamond is a great place if you've got 18 players, but uh, unstructured field space opens up unending possibilities for two sums to kick a ball, toss a frisbee, play catch, throw sticks to a dog, and do much more. Thick woods are wonderful sanctuaries for wildlife, but trails and benches and periodic openings, grassy openings, attract a lot more users. Even if a park system offers varied spaces for physical activity, not everyone knows how to take advantage of them. Some users need to learn new skills. Some need encouragement, and some need an exercise regimen. Some need social support to even show up, have the guts to show up. Even with all this, many, many require other kinds of assistance, partners, equipment, referees, timekeepers, music, safety paraphernalia, and much more. In a word, they need programming. We need great programming to increase park use many times over and to make the activity more enjoyable and to increase its benefits for health and fitness. And of course, these programs must be marketed and promoted by the Parks Department and by the partner agencies that partner with the Parks Department. <clears throat> Parks can help reduce stress and promote mental health, but only if they provide a safe and welcoming environment. 
An empty, frightening park or one overrun with activity. Whoops. Okay, I missed a slide. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I meant to talk about playgrounds a little bit too, which is something that, uh, that TPL specially works on. Uh, many, many playgrounds in urban areas look like this, and we uh, have developed wonderful skills in working with uh, the uh, school boards and also with the students themselves who end up doing a lot of the planning and designing to turn them into beautiful playgrounds. That's actually the same spot that you just saw. Um, <clears throat> And it, it brings a lot more smiles and a lot more exercise to the children. Um, parks can help reduce stress and promote mental health, but only if they're not uh, scary and frightening or overrun with bad activities. So of course, park needs rules and standards of behavior so that everybody knows what's expected of them in the parks. And they also need enforcement uh, hopefully just a little enforcement to get it started and get people off the wrong track and then they'll be become more self-enforcing. But uh, realistically, they need enforcing too. It's not, uh, we can't just uh, assume that you give people a park, don't have any staffing in it, and it'll, it'll take care of itself. And if there isn't enough money for a full-fledged police department working in the parks, rules can also be upheld by uniformed rangers or even just uniformed maintenance workers so that people feel like there's somebody in charge of the park when they're there. A special stress factor for people that reduces their uh, participation in parks can be automobile traffic, particularly for parents with children. An excess of park roads and parking areas not only reduces field space and the number of trees, but it also adds unhealthy noise and smog and may create real and perceived dangers from vehicles. So here you have a picture of uh, the difference in ambiance in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco between a Saturday when cars are allowed and a Sunday when it's closed. So not only can you see the tremendous increase in the actual number of people enjoying the park, but it, this is a funny picture because you see that in the upper picture, um, the uh, non-motorized users are being forced off the roads onto the, onto the trails and then they're forcing the users off the trails themselves. So down in the lower park uh, where you've got the bench sitters um, and you've got the bicyclists and the rollerbladers out in the, out in the roadway, this makes it a, a much more pleasant experience for everybody, not just uh, getting a little bit more space from the parks. And I was very pleased, uh, Tim Netsch gave me a tour this morning, I was very pleased to hear about the closing of the park road in um, in, in Warner Park, yeah, which is really exciting. I hadn't known about that. I want to come down here and bring my bicycle and use that. <clears throat> a completely different park-like space that can reduce stress and, uh, stress and promote health is the community garden. And I don't know how much community gardening is here, but this is another very rapidly growing uh, field uh, throughout urban the urban park worlds. Community gardens have been around for more than a century, but only in recent decades have park city park departments moved into the field, designating garden areas within existing parks, and then also taking unused lots and uh, incorporating them into their park system. The resultant benefits, the resultant spaces, spaces benefit public health in numerous ways, including social connections that don't even necessarily involve gardening, if you like to gamble with Dominoes. <laughs> so at the, uh, at the far end of the spectrum is outright violence in a park, and sometimes a park's reputation is a lot worse than the reality, such as if a homicide is, com is reported committed elsewhere, but they found the body in the park, it'll, it'll create a negative um, uh, press buzz for a long time, which is something that we, we park people have to, to deal with. But making parks feel safe is a comp complicated interplay between culture and rules and enforcement and design and programming. And of course, it has a lot to do with the surrounding neighborhoods too. So one effective way of increasing park use in dangerous areas is through park pooling, uh, like carpooling, but park pooling, group travel, either from the neighborhoods to the parks or within the parks themselves. In New York, in, in Central Park in New York, there's an established meetup time and location for women who want to jog together for safety. 
I talked a lot about uh, earlier about uh, development or denser development around parks, and that's still a great goal. But if it's not possible, use can also be increased through better provision of walking and bicycling and transit routes to parks. Pedestrians should be first and foremost in the minds of planners. You've probably all heard of safe routes to schools, but it's just as important to have safe routes to parks. It's not enough to plunk down a park that might be surrounded by a busy uh, six-lane roadway on all four sides and say, go to this beautiful park. You've got to make it safe to get there. And bicycle access uh, also tremendously increases the reach to a park. It increases it technically 16-fold because a, a person on a bicycle can go about four times faster or four times farther than a person walking. And when you figure out the area covered, it's a square of the distance. So it, that catchment circle, if you want to call it that, uh, ends up being six time, 16 times as much as walking. So making your roadways uh, uh, bicyclable to your parks can have a tremendous impact on uh, making parks uh, more heavily used. And good transit can be even more, can do even more. This is Herman Park in Houston. Houston's not known as, as a transit-oriented city, but it's becoming more so. When, when Houston uh, built its uh, first light rail line, the park people actually lobbied. The, the, the planners knew where the two endpoints of the rail line, where they wanted to be, two main uh, gen mo ride generators, but they weren't sure which route they would take. And the, and the park people lobbied to have the transit line go past and through um, their park so that this transit line here uh, on the left is, um, is the main city transit line. It has two stops in, in Herman Park. Herman Park for many years had a, had a sort of a toy tourist train, a little train that people love to ride. They actually rebuilt the tracks of that tourist train so that it met up with the uh, transit line. And so when you get off the transit line, you can then get on the tourist line and go through the park to other parts of the park. So it's turning their park, because they have the same kind of uh, parking problem that you guys have in Centennial Park and other places, and uh, they had to be very creative about giving people an alternative to driving to their park. <clears throat> Um, the best way of increasing use is through park interconnections, linking parks together with greenways and trails so that people can travel seamlessly from one park to another. One reason that the Minneapolis park system consistently tops our park score ranking list year after year is that the city's parks were conceptualized and designed way back in the 1880s. They were fortunate. They, they, for whatever reason, the planners and the, and the city fathers in Minneapolis uh, designed the parks first and provided development areas around them for the developers to develop. And so what's in, in Minneapolis, it's called the Grand Rounds, and it's a network of connected uh, trails that connect all the parks. And they, they still have some gaps that they have to fill, but it's very clear where their gaps are. Creating a health promoting park system requires greater expertise and resources than any city park agency can provide all by itself. What's needed is a partnership with other public agencies as well as with private organizations and private foundations and corporations and citizen groups and volunteers. And probably many people in this room are part of that fabric of what we call a quilt of funders and advocates. One of my favorite uh, collaborations on the health side of things is the Medical Mile, the centerpiece of Little Rock in Little Rock, Arkansas, of the Little Rock, uh, Arkansas River Trail. It's located in their riverfront park. It's next to the Bill Clinton Presidential Library. The facility offers running, skating, walking, and cycling while also serving as an educational museum of information and inspiration about wellness. Among many exhibits, there's a mural wall, a wellness promenade, and a body, mind, spirit entry plaza. The theme of exercise, smoking sensation, cessation, better nutrition, helmet safety, et cetera, was developed by a project partner, the Arkansas Department of Health. And the catalyst of this effort, which would not have happened if it was totally on the shoulders of the city and the 
uh, and the Park and Health Agencies was the Heart Clinic of Arkansas, which is a private clinic. Clinic physicians unanimously voted to undertake a two-year, $350,000 fundraising effort to assist the Parks and Recreation Department to make it happen. Actually, coincidentally, my organization purchased, this, this was a rail corridor, and my organization purchased this rail corridor uh, back in the, I'm not sure when, 80s, 70s maybe, uh, on behalf of the city, but nobody had the money to do anything with it. Uh, so it was just sitting there as a vacant, uh, unused rail corridor. They took the tracks out, and that was it. And the Heart Clinic uh, stepped up. Uh, they voted to launch this fundraising effort, which they estimated would cost $350,000. And they thought it would take two years to raise the money. They reached the goal in three months. So they expanded the concept. Uh, they realized that when your doctor suggests uh, donating to uh, a cause like this, a lot of people perk up their ears and, and donate it. Uh, so they changed the budget to $2 million to do a better job with the trail, and they met that goal too. Uh, the clinic's leadership demonstrated that the medical community can go beyond the traditional recreation and parks donors and tap into the wealth and generosity of many other uh, residents. Before ending, uh, how are we doing on time? Are we okay on time? Okay, uh, I just want to quickly take advantage of the propitious timing of the fact that, um, that my organization, other people in my organization just finished doing an economic study of the value, the economic value that Nashville is currently getting from its park system, which is very exciting. We don't, we haven't, we haven't done this for uh, every city. Uh, we are only doing this in partnership with cities that that help us raise the money to do it. So it's it's a great step that Nashville did this, and it, it's going to give us a wonderful baseline to to know now how much value the city is getting from its park system, and maybe 10 years from now to do it again and see how that's changed as you. Uh, create and uh, and spruce up your park system. So very, very quickly, uh, we measure, we, we got together with a group of economists, park experts and economists, locked ourselves in a room to talk about what could be measured and what can't be measured. It was a wonderful session, and we learned about uh, the, the factors that really could be measured from the way econom economists think about things. So how much value is the park system bringing to the city in terms of cleaning the air? It came to $3.7 million of value per year here in Nashville. How much through cleaner water, holding the raindrop, reducing the pressure on the sewer system after a, a big storm event, slowing down the, the water so that it can be properly processed uh, instead of running off in, into the uh, sewer system and overflowing the sewers, $16.9 million per year in value to the city for water. Direct use value, uh, how much value do the citizens get from having parks so that they don't have to join private tennis clubs and swimming clubs and golf clubs and, and gyms and do all the things that they basically get all these opportunities for free to do the things that they love to do, play sports and get exercise. $70 million they save on by using the public facilities for free. And then how much health value do they get from from using these facilities We cal in, in terms of reduced doctor's visits, reduced hospital visits, um, and reduce having to take medicines for certain types of uh, diseases and high blood pressure and things like that. Uh, $28 million here in Nashville. Tourism, this happens to be New York City, but think of all the tourism events and sports events that take place in parks in Nashville. It turns out that $160, $116 million is spent by tourists, uh, non-Davidson uh, 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 County uh, people coming here to spend money in, in the city, $116 million. Uh, the tourist industry always talks about hotel visits and restaurants and things like that, but very often we have to remind them they're coming here because of the parks, because of things that are happening in the parks or things that are being organized by the, the parks departments and their uh, partner agencies. 
and then property value, $200 million additional value for people uh, being able to, being willing to spend a little bit more to live in, in buildings and apartments overlooking parks, which results in property tax receipts of about $2 million a year for the city treasury. And as more buildings are built downtown along the waterfront and along parks and around parks, that number is going to increase uh, here in town. So normally, uh, this is where I stop, but I, and, and I will stop in a moment, <clears throat> but I thought it's probably on everybody's mind, you know, how does the election affect all this? And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna wax long and, uh, and uh, uh, with much wisdom, because none of us have a whole lot of wisdom about this. But I, I, do, I do wanna say that, um, ironically, uh, we, we have spent for the last 10 years, uh, last eight years, and, and way more than the last eight years, 16 years and 24 years, we've spent a lot of our activities here in, in Washington, D.C., lobbying for the federal government to get more involved in city parks. And to be honest, the federal government has resisted, has strongly resisted, uh, getting involved with city parks. They, they tend to say, okay, if you go to Congress, they tend to say, nice hearing from you guys, glad you like the parks. Go talk to your mayor, go talk to your city council. So uh, in a way, we're in a lucky moment that uh, our, our brilliant people in Washington, whatever ideas they come up with next, and we're all sitting uh, with bated breath to see what happens, like you are, um, they haven't invested that much in city parks yet, and uh, we don't think that they can actually do that much damage if they come up with some crazy ideas. Uh, about city parks. City parks have been on the shoulders of city residents uh, for many decades and they're going to continue to be. I think the people in this room uh, recognize the importance to city parks to all of us and will continue to lobby the mayor, the city council, work with local foundations, work with local uh, wealthy individuals to uh, set up conservancies and to uh, strengthen the conservancies and uh, I think we're on an, on, a, on an upward trajectory with city parks and whatever uh, uh, scary things happen in Washington in the coming months, uh, we should be able to uh, ride them out, at least from the parks view here in Nashville and around the country. So thank you all for coming out here. Very much appreciate it. If we have time for questions, I'd love to uh, talk about your city and what's on your mind. Thank you.